can you give me a Doppler reset? Or yeah. actually, why don't you just, um, can you change um, Herc's location to, since we're going up a clip, change it to uh, USBL? Yeah. How's that? That's beautiful. Great. Not as loose as I thought, but maybe. This all looks pretty. Pretty yeah, cohesive, right? We can try right? that. We can poke it. I like this one. You know, some of these look really loose, potentially. In the triclops cam, maybe. Indeed. We'll try them. Karen, did you hear, uh... That it was still bad? We started. Oh my god. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. All right, Crap bell coming on. All right. So I'm going for, is it this one? Suspense is killing me. Nope. No, not that one. Do you mm. see anything else that might be? This, maybe this one, or? Who? Yeah. Mm, it's a little too flat for me, I think. I think that's just crust. I'm gonna pass on that. Looks pretty crusty to me. Yeah. Are you looking that at one? this one? Or this one. Alright. Yeah, just poke around, whatever you whatever you think might be loose. Is that too flat? I'll take it. We only have two samples, so I mean, we can grab quite a few more of the shift, I think. So yeah, we'll take that. Okay. Okay, can go in one of the smaller starboard <coughs> inboard boxes. Go for the one most forward, please. Okay. This is 196. Somebody is asking, are we coming up slope for this dive like usual? Yes. Uh, so again, we started at a depth around 3,000, or excuse me, around, uh, yeah, 3,000 meters. Uh, Slowly making our way up. I think I got Was that, it, what was the question? Yep, yeah. I'm not sure what the expected shallowest depth is, but we did start around 3,000 meters. Nice. And if we can, before we lift off, I'd like to look at some of the corals that are directly in front of us on the verticals, surfaces. Yeah, um, 
just since we're here and it might be easiest <coughs> to do it here than upslope, can we grab a small piece of this, like a snip and slurp? Oh, yeah. yeah. Can we give it one second? Or can we wait for a sec? Can we just wait one sec? I gotta finish this other one before. Okay. So we can look at some we'll others. Yeah, we we can we can get a tighter zoom on it. That I would might be have to too. actually move the vehicle, anyways. Yeah, that's uh, as much zoom as I've got. Uh, okay, video. Can you go wide? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna need to tuck in further. I'm good now. If you want, okay. to still do it. The, so the reasoning for sampling this coral is the last watch had seen very little actually corals and so this is actually one of the first corals of the dive um, with some exceptions of, of some black corals, heteropathy species and um, aridogorgia they had observed but these primnodes are notoriously difficult to identify on the seafloor and so having a small piece of it is helpful to um, identify on deck. It's much easier to work like that uh, than trying to identify it from zooms alone. Yeah, I definitely have to move to get closer to this one. Nick? Somebody online is curious about hydrothermal vents. Um, so why aren't we seeing any here? And when will we see them again? Yeah, usually you'll see uh, hydrothermal vents near spreading systems, so along the uh, mid-ocean ridges, um, where two continents um, diverge apart from each other. Uh, what we're studying is intraplate volcanism, Okay. Um, so My these volcanoes that that hasn't put you in tend to, to uh, uh, form within um. plate, uh, in intraplate settings, within plate boundaries. Uh, and again, those hydrothermal vent systems are uh, more often found uh, uh, near Steve, or very can you close to which of these uh, spreading you want? The lower, okay. the lower, yeah. And this can go in slurp one. Roger that. It's okay if you get a couple of branches in there. We're just looking for maybe some 10 centimeter segment uh, pieces. Okay. So that's probably most of the, like the better part of half of it. But um, a couple of branches, you know, in total 10, 10 centimeters in length is plenty. Okay, I'll try and do that. <laughs> yeah. Do what you can. No worries, yeah. Give it a go. So um, right, so is the when it's snipped, I can give you a genus ID for the field um, identification. We can write that down in the sample log too, because it'll close. The polyps will close up, and it'll be a lot easier What's to tell yeah. which genus yeah, it is. is on that. I, it's really tight in there. I'm sorry. Yeah. No worries. What? I don't know if I can differentiate between the branches. That's all right. Um, go for it. Like here is a good location. Yeah, let's go for it. See okay. what we get. Beautiful. That, that's more than enough. Yep. If um, oh. still there's still one. some in there. Yeah. If it if it's tenuous, we can throw it in the forward box. It does seem really negative. Okay. Yeah, it's not going to float. They're they're solid. Two branches in there, I think, is plenty. So in the forward box, then. 
Yeah. Yep. Okay. Either side. Let me retract. This is one nine seven. So I'm going to say this is the genus Norella, N A R E double L A. And uh, wait, we'll wait, update the field ID as we get data okay, back up on the ship. Thank you. Great. So it looks like two branches or so. Okay. I did see, I think I saw where the other branch fell. Do you want me to try and slurp that up? Um, no, it's not worth it. We got enough. Okay. Yeah. This is just for confirming an ID. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Coincidentally, a lot of our collections that have been new species have been kind of the least assuming corals, the ones that kind of fly, fly below the radar, you know, that look like something we already know. So it's always good to confirm, uh, and oftentimes we're surprised with <laughs> potential new species discoveries <laughs> because of it. Some other corals here? Uh, no, I think we are okay. ready to go and we'll move up slope at a, a gentle pace, kind of, you know, leaving enough coins in the zoom bank mm -hmm. uh, okay. Absolutely. to do opportunistic work. Okay, sounds great. Right. So we are using an ROV in order to conduct these dives. ROV stands for Remotely okay, Operated going. Vehicle. So we have Gabby as well as Karen who are here in the control van on the ship. And they are um, piloting the ROVs. So we have Hercules, which is the one that is uh, doing the bulk of the operation. So that's the one that was just sampling the coral nice. yep, a few moments ago. A it's a colony of Remula Gorgia militaris, I believe. The last watch saw some too. It's pretty common. Uh, it was just on Orient ourselves. Yep, exactly. That's what it is. It's a golden coral, Chrysogorgid, but in the genus Remula Gorgia. It's got some crinoid associates. Those red, reddish, brown feather stars. So in addition, Thanks. in addition to Hercules, we are also using Atalanta as the second ROV, and you can see the view from Atalanta on Channel 2 that's peering down on Hercules uh, from about 30 meters above. Somebody in the chat named Alisa wants to know how the master works to manipulate the arm. <laughs> so I don't um, know, Gabby, if you have a chance to explain how do you uh, manipulate Hercules' arm when you're on the ship. Grab a scale, Gab. Yeah. Nice. So this is uh, likely another species of primnoid. You're off SPL. Uh, thank you. Sorry. You're Is good. that what you said before? Yeah. And I was like, in the zone. <laughs> You're in the zone. Um, Got the top zoom. side controller for the arm um, is connected to the actual arm by um, a serial connection. Uh, so, like, 
basically the same way as some of your most simple electronics, maybe even your like GPS or something, talk to your computer. Um, that's the landscape. way that the uh, top side controller is connected to the arm. And then it's just set up so that you put it in the shape that you want the arm to have. Go for zoom. And it takes, and then the arm takes that shape based on feedback from just very simple potentiometers in the arm. Nice. So this is a Go away. shrimp on a dead uh, euplectelid sponge, or uh, sorry, ferreid sponge stalk, sponge colony. Thanks for that explanation, Gabby. Really appreciate it. Yeah. So science, are we looking to go to waypoint eight still? Uh, yeah, we, we can gently uh, curve up. So we, yeah, we can kind of go actually towards nine and kind of bypass eight. You know, by a few hundred me uh, a few meters, it's okay. Roger, gently curve. Yeah, gently curve. That'll be two five zero ROV. Uh huh. Two five zero. Okay. For your next heading. Yeah, and it looks like. Maybe we can get 10 meters out of this. Great. A 10 meter move to, wait, so let's see, 250. Oh, interesting, okay, yeah. Yeah, it so so basically Steve was saying that we can pa bypass eight and just kind of head up this way. Um, okay. Might be a little bit of lateral lean versus straight up. That's okay. Okay. I'm ready when you are. Yeah, go for it. Great, let's go for it. Bridge now. Good morning. Uh, three zero meters, two five zero, please. Oh, I was reading the. I was reading the chart backwards. Roger. It is oh yeah, we're going this way. Shot yeah. left. Yeah. Good one. I did tell you two five zero, right? Mm -hmm. That was me. Great. I'm just getting a little bit better sorted for two five zero, and you just that was just ten meters. That'll be easy. So some of these... Uh, that was three zero meters. But oh, it was three zero? We can stop oh, okay. if we need to do it anytime. As soon as we came up over the top of whatever we just came over the top of, where it kind of leveled out a little bit, we saw an explosion in the diversity of primnoids. I can see at least probably four species, uh, I suspect, just based on differences in the branching pattern alone. Um, so something happened. Four, four to five species, actually. There's an unbranched one as well, probably a candidella, um, just in this area. Were you just describing what we just saw as an explosion of coral? Explosion of coral diversity, yeah. Oh, diversity, okay. Uh, <laughs> I was going to say we're like four corals. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, relative to what they've been seeing. Has it been that bad? It's It's been pretty... Um, Sorry. Uh, we would say We would say depauperate. <laughs> depauperate. Okay. Yeah. What's the word? Depauperate? Depauperate? Yeah. Depauperate. Sounds like something you'd call the like commoners or the plebes or something. <laughs> Depauperate. Depauperate. Yeah. <laughs> Depauperate. Lacking in numbers or variety of species. Wow. It's actually a very specific term. Wow. Mm -hmm. um, can Atalanta take a new heading of 250? Yes. The more you know, right? The more you know? The more you know, always. My brain's feeling a little depauperate right now. <laughs> <laughs> it is early. Is that going to be the word of the watch? Uh, might be. It might be. Yes. It doesn't have the same ring. As, as what, Steve? <laughs> others we have <laughs> deployed in recent memory. Depauperate. Go for Zoom video. Depauperate. But this is not depauperate. <laughs> this is actually uh, quite interesting landscape. Uh, I don't know what this is. Um, it looks like it's a primnoid, but I'm looking for nodes where it could be a bamboo coral too. It actually strikes me more of a bamboo coral, um, even though I can't see nodes from this far away, just based on the on the uh, sequences of the polyps. The polyps are not in whorls. Um, the polyps are kind of either alternating or on one side of the colony only. So this would be a bamboo coral kind of sparsely branching one. It looks similar to one we sampled on previous dives. But of course... Um, we can go take a closer look. We have some time, sort yep. of. With, 
Do with you want a closer look? Yeah, sure, if you have time. <laughs> with bamboo corals and primnoids, make no assumptions. Uh, they will always surprise you when you least expect it. <laughs> Waiting around the corner. <laughs> Okay, go for zoom. And you know, with good reason, these are two families that are exclusively found in the deep sea. So, you know, they, they are super well adapted to this environment. This is their environment, and we are visitors here. Um, is that what you need, Steve? Yes, that's good. Okay, go can away. Can we um, actually, oh, sorry, uh, can we hold that for another second and look on the left side of the colony? Left, the, yeah, the left branch. Okay, so there are nodes, yeah. It looks like the branching is... I oh, can't really tell where the branching is. Okay, I should get going yep. here, Steve. Okay. There are nodes, though. The base has one node. Uh, but oftentimes, some, sometimes with the deeper species, the nodes can be either over-calcified, uh, which obscures them, or uh, they can be very faint, uh, appearing golden in color, which makes it hard to see the dark uh, color against the white of the calcium carbonate skeleton. Somebody online is asking about Hercules again. Um, is there a minimum depth that Hercules needs to be for exploration? So the maximum that Hercules can go is 4,000 meters uh, below the surface, but what about a minimum? Um, <laughs> well, <Seems amazing. laughs> it really depends on how brave you're feeling. Go for yeah. some. Um, so a really good rule of thumb is to keep the vehicle um, a little bit deeper than the length of the tether. Um, the idea being that if you do end up coming up and things sort of get out of control, you can't come up all the way to the surface near the ship's propeller or jet pump or whatever. Um, Go wide. What's the shallowest you've seen so these vehicles operate the, at? The, so you keep, in this case, the tether is 30 meters long, so you might keep the vehicle, um, you might keep Atalanta at 30 meters or more depth under is these this, circumstances. Is this a something or is it set It looks like a cookie star. Yeah. Uh, go for zoom. That said, there <laughs> are exceptions when all the conditions are in really, are really in alignment and, uh, weather is good and there's something you really really want to see you might actually push that okay got it so that looks like a sarah master cookie star that's one we actually collected a few dives ago the ravioli yeah. i'll write that Go away. yeah um i have one more request which um let me know if we can do it on the fly just pop a niskin in this area yeah yeah niskin pop a niskin because this is not depauperate is the opposite of depauperate, and we're <laughs> going to try and characterize the environmental DNA associated with this primnoid community. Papa Niskin for the last dive. That's how we celebrate on the Nautilus. Thank you. <laughs> is it easier for you guys to go for the top or the bottom? We can start at one or six. Um, I'll do six. Okay. I think I did one the other day. Now, one nine nine. One nine nine. Mm -hmm. As an A Y E, not. Oh, I. sorry. Wait. Nope. That might be. I think. Hold on. One nine eight. Um. I think these are misnumbered. One nine eight. Yeah. One nine eight. Roger. Good morning, Mom. I, I can actually say the same thing. Good morning, Mom. Good morning, Samantha's mom. And my cousin Christopher, who's going diving in Monterey today, actually. Oh, so, oh that's exciting. Something good. Standing that's across awesome. Uh, deep sea to <laughs> inner tidal right now. Good morning to everybody. And somebody good evening. From good afternoon. And good night. And good morning. <laughs> good morning and good night, depending on where you are. St. Peter's, St. Petersburg, Florida. Cat Teller. So we can actually see. All right, I'm gonna see okay. if I can catch up on some questions here in the chat. They're kind of piling up a bit.
All right, so the current water temperature of Her that Hercules is at right now is 1.8 degrees Celsius. <clears throat> and that seems to be about normal uh, for this depth. What we're doing right now with Hercules is we are taking an eDNA sample. So you can see one of the arms of Hercules is trying to pull that, uh, that tab there. And that's going to collect a water sample where Hercules um, is right now. Yeah. And in that water sample is going to be something called eDNA. It stands for environmental DNA. So as the organisms at this depth are naturally shedding, go? sloughing off um, any cells, mm. those, <coughs> excuse me, those uh, naturally remain in the water column. And as uh, this Niskin bottle collects that water, their eDNA is then um, inside that, uh, that water sample. And that can be brought back up to the ship and um, looked at. And so it just gives a DNA profile of all the different types of living things that are at this depth. Or within a certain range, not all of the living things. It, it could, it could, uh, it could actually tell us a little bit about all of the things. Oh, wow. Well. Um, but it depends on what level of sequencing we want to use. So if we want to know about all the things, we can probably get a very low resolution picture, like percentage of eDNA that's, you know, crustacean, percentage of eDNA that's coral, but it won't give us the resolution of like okay. species. So they But it only, it can only go for a certain like range, right? Like it can't get all the, you can't get all the information from all the animals all over the world. In, oh, in the right, ocean. yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep, uh, the range is pretty um, limited, but it's also not well understood. You know, we know that temperature is the biggest thing affecting environmental DNA. Um, lifespan, I guess, if you can call it that, or longevity in the water column. Yeah. Um, Science, is there anything else we want to do here? Negative. Coffee's kicking in and I'm feeling good. <laughs> <laughs> She's waking up everybody. All right, Nick, here's a great question for you. And I'm going to also kind of follow up with this other question about samples. So first of all... Extraordinary sponge graveyard. Sorry, I, I know you're trying to... It's okay. Have a, uh, I was just remarking that this sponge debris field is really stunning. It's all of this uh, stick and twiggy rubble is all sponge, uh, sponge debris. It's accumulated at this spot. Just like yeah. It, general. Now that you mention around. it, it is a very dense oh, there, yeah. collection of it. Usually, it's a bit more scattered, in my opinion. But this is like a really oh, dense a pocket of it. There's a little hotarian in there. Sponge graveyard. Go wide. Although sponges could be very well dead many, many, many years or even decades longer before they actually fall over. I think it's just that this is just a really interesting spot where they accumulate, but it tells you something a little bit about the sedimentation rate in this area. Very, very slow. These things are not getting covered up. Go for zoom. Stop there. It might be a barnacle. It's tough to tell what it is. But it's okay, we don't need to okay. linger. Go ahead. All right. So Nick, can you tell us a bit more about what kinds of rock are we seeing? What's the story here? Is 100% of the ocean's floor um, volcanic? Um. Almost all of it is volcanic, yeah. So when we use the term volcanic, uh, we talk about um, any type of uh, magma that's been solidified at the Earth's surface or lava. Um, you do see some evidence of uh, 
uh, uh, cooling further below uh, the Earth's surface in uh, rocks like gabbro uh, or ophiolites, uh, which are um, ancient remnants of, of spreading centers, uh, which record the uh, uh, the entire column of from pelagic sediments down to mantle peridotite, uh, and those can be found um, abducted, uh, abducted onto the continental lithosphere um, in certain areas around the world. Uh, but for the most part, yeah, we are seeing almost entirely uh, basaltic rock, which is a volcanic extrusive. Um, rock. Volcanic and obtrusive. Noise. Nav, can we drop a target in this general area and just call it like sponge graveyard? Sure. <laughs> it's interesting enough. Spooky. <laughs> Speaking of spooky, somebody actually did ask um, a few minutes ago, how many ghosts are on the sea floor and how many have you seen? Excellent question. I have seen zero ghosts on the sea floor and I don't know about anybody else in this room, but I do know that we have explored several um, shipwrecks, not on this expedition, but in previous expeditions that Nautilus has done. They have uh, taken a look at multiple I think the the count was dozens of shipwrecks previously, but I don't think that we've seen any ghosts. I've seen Casper. You've seen Casper? Yeah, the Casper <laughs> octopus. <laughs> There's an octopus out here called Casper. Is uh, it spooky looking? That is probably a new genus of um, deep water octopods and has been seen several times, I think four times so far over the past uh, five or six, even up five, six, seven, eight years. Um, Go for Zoom. This first identified uh, as a potential new genus or maybe even new family by the Okeanos Explorer, but we saw it last year in our Johnson Atoll cruise. Um, and there is a, sadly, a, a wanted uh, request okay. for cool. this particular octopus. And um, there's been some popular press articles written about it lately how it is so distinctive that they could almost identify it from uh, photo and video as a new species. But of course, specimens are always really, really important because it, it establishes what we call the, the holotype or the, you know, the, the, the name uh, is associated with that one particular specimen and that's easily referenced. Um, so if we ever see the Casper again, it is um, likely a collection target, but I think we're a little bit shallower than its normal distribution range, so I don't think we'll find it on this cruise. And octopus are very hard to collect. They escape and stuff like that. Yeah. I can only imagine. Also, chimera are commonly known as ghost sharks. What's oh, that? Yeah. Chimera. What about them? They sometimes are called ghost sharks as a common name. Ooh. We haven't seen any, but... <laughs> Go for Zoom. Hold there. Are you happy for a move to be put in, Gabby? I think so, yeah. Great. I am going to want to collect some more rocks here pretty soon. Oh, um, okay. Hold if on. If that's all right. We've gone about 30 meters. Yes. No. That is correct. Less than that. <laughs> <laughs> My reasoning is that this is our last dive. We only have two rocks. We uh, have three rocks, three. excuse me. Um, and uh, yeah, I want to fill up as many as I can before. Uh, the shift is over, so probably around every half hour or so, if that's if that's possible. Sweet. Okay. Well, there's rocks yeah. around us. Yeah. Um, just go ahead and sit down wherever you think you might find something loose and make the call. Nick's gonna get his rocks today. Yeah. Well, we have to get our last rock uh, rock cutting session in tomorrow, and. I uh, want to invite all of those who haven't had a chance to cut rocks to oh. join in on the fun. We got Steve to cut a rock the other day. Really excited <laughs> about that. It was so fun. Steve gave me a nickname, um, The Breaker. The Breaker. <laughs> oh, that's, one. that's amazing. 
I cut a rock partially, <laughs> and it didn't cut all the way, and so I was able to break it with my bare hands. Yeah. <laughs> Brittany the breaker. Brittany the breaker. That's me. Are you looking over here, maybe? Yeah, that's what I was looking at. Ah. All right, this question came in a while ago. Um, do we ever have to move the ship on a dive to get more distance with your ROVs? Absolutely. So again, the ROVs are connected to each other and also to the ship. So Hercules is connected to Atalanta, Atalanta is connected to uh, <coughs> the ship, and in order to move the ROVs, the ship does need to move along with them. So that is a large part of what uh, Samantha is coordinating. So whenever you hear Samantha say, bridge nav. Is this too small? Yeah, I would. Could you grab one of those too, please? Yes. Um, so all three vehicles are moving in tandem together. So it's a very, you have to be very coordinated in order for that to happen. And we make it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's that nice. looks good. Uh, which box would you like to send? Forward, starboard, bow box. Okay. The small one. Hopefully. Uh. Okay. All right. How many trips do you do in a year, and do you get breaks to see your families? Excellent question. So, depending on what role you have on the ship or what job you have on the ship, um, I think that answer would depend. So again, this is my very, very first time on the Nautilus. Um, I've been out here for almost a month and that's it for me. <laughs> so I'm going to go home and uh, in just a few days and see my family again. Yes, absolutely. But then there are others who have been on the ship for months or who come out repeatedly um, for multiple trips during an expedition season. So it just depends. You're off SPL, Nick. That was 198. 199. 199, thank you. We're almost there. 1999. Almost there, Steve. Except 199. Sample 200, yeah. Is it going to be a biology sample or is it going to be a rock sample? Let's not make this a competition, <laughs> eh? <laughs> Wait, since when? <laughs> I know. <laughs> Somebody online said that they saw the word batrioidal in the uh, wild <laughs> yesterday. Okay, we, Steve's requested that we actually skip 8 and 9 waypoints okay. and just go to 10, which Beauty. is 280. Great. 280 it is. Um, 280. Okay. Um, science, are you set for us to move on? Copy. Okay. Both science. <laughs> huh? Both science? Both yes. science, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I gave a thumbs up. We, we use hand signals back here to communicate. <laughs> <laughs> okay, good for a move then? <laughs> uh, yeah. Bridge, huh? A closed fist means rock sample. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is the Four. Yeah. Uh, three zero meters, two eight zero, please. What's the code for coral sample? <laughs> is that a s is that a snip? snip? I think it's probably something like that no. or something. Because I was gonna say rock paper scissors would actually work for us here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Snip a coral, collect a rock. Maybe we should just do that. See if who can sample one one nine nine and two hundred. <laughs> rock paper scissors. <laughs> rock paper scissors. <laughs> I love it. Rock paper. What's paper? Yeah. So we're looking at a sea lily here. This was observed on the last watch. We actually also collected one of these uh, on a previous dive. Possibly a bathycrinus or bathycrinidae, as as it's been identified. Okay, going. A viewer is writing. It's nice to see no bandage fingers from the people cutting the rock, the rocks. Yeah, that's one thing I was uh, a little apprehensive about before I started cutting rocks is 
this thing is strong enough to cut a rock, it's absolutely going <laughs> to be able to cut my finger off. Um, but then Nick reassured me, and I was able to actually like touch the, the blade, and it's very, very dull, surprisingly. You touch the blade when it's not Go for zoom. Yes, I, yes, yeah. when it's not on. <laughs> ah, we got a fish. Yep, so this is a cusk eel. And uh, it's, I believe it's in the genus Basozetus. Okay, go in. Basozetus. Yep. Basozetus. Excellent. And our move is now 280. 280. Uh, let's have Atalanta take 280. It is. Awesome. Technically 279.9. Um, <laughs> there's a plus one button on there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very exacting. This is a really awesome question. I like it. Uh, what is everyone's dream clear, dive spot? Need, need oh one. yeah, I would say <laughs> somewhere <laughs> in international waters in the equatorial Western Pacific. Hmm. Equatorial On a sea mount. Western Pacific sea yeah. mount international waters. Yeah. Cool. Park and why is that? Uh, so everyone is probably heard of or maybe is familiar with the coral triangle right uh, this area of high coral high shallow water coral diversity in the tropical uh, western pacific or indo-pacific and um, i want to test some hypotheses that the coral triangle actually extends into the deep sea um, and that that area also has high deep sea coral diversity as much as um, shallow water coral diversity and it's it's been largely inaccessible um, and because primarily because you know, there haven't been the resources to deploy in that area. Um, but you know, if, if the opportunity ever arose to par partner with some uh, either local jurisdictions in that area or uh, dive in international waters um, to just explore and characterize the seafloor for patterns of diversity, I think it would go a long way to understanding you know, the diversity of deep water coral species and kind of what our maximum uh, diversity uh, levels could be in a particular area of seafloor. So it's a Go it's a hypothesis. It's a hypothesis that I would be love to uh, love to test. And um, there's been some promising work done by some of the very early cruises uh, on the NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer off Indonesia uh, in 2008, I believe, um, using uh, I don't know which ROV they were using. I don't think they were using Hercules. Um, but uh, they may have been using other vehicles that allowed them to get good uh, imagery, but not collect specimens. And uh, they saw some pretty extraordinary diversity Thanks, of deep water corals. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, they weren't able to collect. Mm -hmm. I'll have to find out which vehicle they were using. Yeah, that's super interesting. I actually, believe it or not, I had never heard about that coral triangle. Um, okay. Yeah. I hope you. I hope your dreams come true. I hope you're able to go out there, test your hypothesis, and see some really awesome deep water coral species. Okay. Little Little Hercules was the first. Um, ROV used on the Okeanos Explorer to explore the deep waters of Indonesia. And that was a, a partnership program uh, between NOAA Ocean Exploration and some of the local jurisdictions there. Little Herc will be on the next cruise. Great. Little Herc gets around quite a bit. Oh, yeah. <laughs> a little Very Herc portable. Do the, uh, Papa Moko Akea. Yep. Little Herc is going to go out on the the next uh, cruise. Awesome. Yep. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Are we happy to keep moving or you wanna? Oh, uh, yeah. <coughs> yeah. Yeah, totally. Bridge, no? Yeah, Little Herc is uh, rated to 6,000 meters, I believe. 
Nice. Um, so even though uh, three zero Little Herc two has zero. no manipulator arm, it can get to spots that Big Herc can't. Um, and in this case, it might be some deep water wrecks or something like that. And Gabby, how big is Little Herc? Um, I want to say like a third the size of Big Herc. Uh -huh. Maybe even smaller, maybe a quarter oh the size. <laughs> small so cool. uh, if you removed all of the like maybe the cameras from Herc could you fit little Herc inside Herc <laughs> yeah definitely yeah how many Hercs can we fit in Herc <laughs> no you'd have you'd have to remove some like stanchions and support members but yeah sort of so where does little Herc go because big Herc kind of takes up that whole hanger takes up the whole what hanger um little Herc stores really nicely on deck okay uh, it is it's quite small you like might see like it when Adelanta? we load. What's that? Like Adelanta stays on deck? Uh, it's mm, slightly different shape than Adelanta. Oh yeah, but just doesn't go away. Stays out all the time. It doesn't go away. <laughs> yeah, I hope I can see Little Herc um, as we get off yeah, and the yeah, next group I, comes on. I bet you will, because it'll be, even if you want to, we can probably make it happen, because Little Herc will be in the warehouse at the very least. Yeah, I think we can keep the moves going for a little while. At the same speed, we'll still be able to stop. Roger. Oh, if you have time, uh, just back up a half a meter. Uh -huh. I just caught something out of the corner of my eye. There's a cup coral right here. Something so wee. Yeah. Yeah, okay. very small. <laughs> Do your best. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do your best. Go for zoom. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's unfortunately deceased. Uh, there's no living tissue there, oh. but uh, yeah, that's a okay. small cup coral. Tough oh, to tell the, what it could be. It seems a little fouled with marine snow and debris, so you can't quite see the structure that you need to ID. But it's probably a caryophyllid of some type. But that's just my suspicion based on some some of the other external features that I can see. So tiny. All right, so we did just see a cup coral that um, is no longer alive and uh, people online are also noticing that there are a lot of uh, dead sponges too. And so there was a question about the remains of sponges. Why are they more common? Look at that. Is that rock lustrous? Yeah. Lustrous oh. rock. Oh. Oh. Shiny. Shiny. We got the geologist saying Lustrous. shiny, so that's a wow. That's a big deal. Is that tar? It's glass, right? Volcanic Maybe. glass? Yeah. Is there a, is there a technical term? Can we poke it? What? Can we poke it? Yeah. It looks absolutely almost metallic. Are we that's really interesting? Wow, interesting. Are we yeah. calling that anything specific, Nick? Uh, I would not know what to call it at this point. Um. Other than um, shiny rock. <laughs> yeah. It is so shiny. That's very cool. I don't think we've seen anything like that yet, have we? Not. Um, I haven't. Not exposed <laughs> like this. Yeah. I mean, we've seen some some classy looking okay. textures once we cut the rocks open, but nothing exposed like this in the. This move was five meters left, so. Uh, if we want to poke anything, we could. Uh, Looks like there's more in the sand there. The what's that? Sand? Uh, the move is ending. So I wonder if that's a pelagonite, that brown it. substance that's How around bizarre. it there. Yeah, brown one, I would just put it as some volcanic glass for now. Oh. Spoke too soon. I already said shiny rock. <laughs> that works, too. What about the rocks in the sediment? Are those, I think those are attached? Down on the bottom there. Mm, 
really strange. Yeah. Just like only this teeny yeah. tiny little spot. Yeah, they feel very attached. Yeah, it's okay. Can you just zoom in one more time? If you don't mind. Yeah, these little brown bits might just be uh, pelagonite, which is just kind of a, a hydrothermally altered basalt glass. That's just super, super crazy to see that uh, exposed like this. Okay, it's time to get cracking. All right, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Very, very interesting. Wow. I think there might be more of that down below on the bottom of the frame. Maybe there'll be more ahead. Maybe. Ready for another move? Sure. Bridge, now. Three zero meters, two eight zero. So Nick, I have a question, might be a little silly, but when we just saw that shiny part of the rock there just a few moments ago, it didn't have any ferromanganese crust. So does that maybe indicate that it was like younger? Not what? That it was younger or like just hasn't, that part of the rock hasn't been there as long? Or what is, what do you think that means? That's, I mean, the first thing that would pop into my mind that, you know, if you're gonna see some kind of volcanic glass, it's usually means that it's extremely young, which I, I, I really doubt is the case for that particular patch, um, which means some other kind of scouring mechanism might have uh, might have made that happen. Um, which, like you said, you would expect to see some ferromanganese crust on there, and I don't know why that little one patch would not have any type of precipitation. Uh, it really is a mystery to me. Could be metallic as well. Um, that was my second guess. Some kind of uh, metal oxide, maybe that um, won't accumulate any ferromanganese on top. But again, these are just um, this is just speculation. Yeah. So based on the samples that we collect um, from the seafloor. You know, we take the rock samples, bring them on the ship, cut them open. Are you able to then get an idea of how many times a volcano has erupted just based on those samples? No, not just by looking at the samples. Um, it takes a lot of rigorous testing just to uh, get an age determination. Uh, there have been some studies done in the past that have shown multiple signs of eruption, multiple eruption cycles, uh, and that's usually by sampling different areas of the hot spot, so, uh, excuse me, different areas of the seamount. Uh, so you'll collect one sample towards the base and get one age, uh, and then another sample near the summit of the seamount and collect a much younger age. Uh, so that can be indicative of uh, a re-eruption event, uh, something that, Go for uh, like a resurgent volca volcanic event of the same uh, lava source, or even possibly if they have completely different chemistries, it might be an overlapping hotspot uh, with a completely different magma source. So this is a glass sponge in the genus Colophagus. Okay. 
Okay, um, go away. One of the few that tends to produce these um, multiple heads uh, in, in a structure, um, but this particular genus is pretty well known from this area. So going back to the eDNA sample that we collected a few minutes ago, um, again, that eDNA stands for environmental DNA, but somebody online wants to know about, is it possible to get a profile of the different minerals that might be in the water from that uh, eDNA sample too, or mm -hmm. is that just something that we are generally just not interested in looking at with, with those samples? Uh, not with the way that we process the water samples, but there is a way of taking water and looking at some of the chemistry, uh, mineral chemistry. Uh, for example, yeah, three zero meters to two eight zero. Uh, there are different experiments and assays that can be done to look at the carbonate minerals uh, that are dissolved in the water, uh, as well as other trace minerals and metal, well, trace metals at least, yeah. not, min not, not minerals. Um, but those are kind of the big oceanographic uh, tools that are used to characterize water. But that's not our objective on this particular dive with that particular sample. We are on the lookout for stony corals, though, if we ever see any. And um, we did see a cup coral uh, a few minutes ago, but uh, it was dead and it unfortunately didn't provide us enough material. Um, to complete that experiment with, so we declined to take a water sample associated with that. Yeah, I was thinking about that, but I, I think we should wait a little bit because sure. it's gonna, the slope's gonna moderate further and I uh, don't wanna use the t scoop too soon. Nick wants to scoop some, ru some nuggets. Is that what's going on? Just, uh, just <laughs> throwing out the option there. Just a six piece, six piece nugget meal. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I was wondering that I wasn't making the connection. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so going back to the uh, sponge skeletons that we're seeing all over the place. Uh, yeah, so we're seeing a lot of dead sponges, not because of some mass catastrophe that wiped out all the sponges in this area, but more likely um, just because it takes a really, really, really long time for those skeletons to degrade. Um, so sponges a lot of times have a skeleton made out of silica, which is quite different than the bones that make up our skeleton. So if there were uh, human bones, in this area, they would be gone a lot sooner than the uh, skeletons of the sponges. So that's why we're seeing a lot of the sponge skeletons around here, just because of their um, the material that they're made out of. Yeah, silica is is, is less likely to dissolve in seawater, uh, especially in this part. The seawater um, around this area is relatively rich in silica, dissolved silica. So um, there's a low propensity for those things to dissolve back into solution, unlike um, more calcium carbonate skeletons, uh, corals, for example. So we don't see a lot of coral rubble until we move much, much shallower, sh usually shallower than about five to 700 meters. You can start getting accumulations. Mm. And the sedimentation rate is low, so nothing covers the dead skeletons up down here. They just kind of sit out. Occasionally they accumulate crust. But we know that um, the processes that uh, facilitate crust precipitation are very Zoom. different on rocky surfaces versus uh, biological biogenic surfaces because of microbially mediated activities. 
Nice unbranched bamboo coral. I believe this is one we've sampled before. I can see some really gnarly intertentacular sclerites that help identify it to oh, maybe, uh, maybe one clade or the other. Bridge now. There's some J J clade uh, unbranched bamboos uh, that have some really gnarly zero, uh, tentacles like that. Okay, so it is now five o'clock here, um, Hawaiian Standard Time. This is the four to eight crew, if anybody is just joining us on the live stream, hello and welcome. This is the final dive of okay, this expedition, NA-153. Sorry to say it, I don't wanna go, but um, yeah, this is Brittany. Um, Science Communication Fellow, along with the rest of the four to eight crew. We have Nick, we have Steve, Bronwyn, Samantha, Gabby, Karen, and Logan. And we're gonna see that whale any minute. <laughs> yeah. Any minute now, any we're minute gonna now. see that whale. Brittany's wearing her lucky shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe true. the whale will be uh, sample 200. <laughs> no. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that, that would be that would be most unfortunate. Yeah, <laughs> probably most illegal as well. Yeah. Illegal, yeah. That's, that's, that's what I was going it. for. Yeah, <laughs> we are not permitted to do anything like that. We have that no plans to do anything though. like that. <laughs> Where would he even put it? In my pocket. That's not the first question that comes to my mind usually <laughs> when. Yeah. Definitely not sampling whales today, folks. But hopefully we could see one, and that'd be really cool. But yeah. as I said at the very beginning, I'm not holding my breath for it. We could get an eDNA sample near one. <laughs> cool. Yeah, that would be interesting, I guess. Um, yeah, we could. How much longer will this dive be? Um, good question. So we have a tentative, a very tentative off-bottom time of around 8 o'clock, but we're going to have some conversations leading up to that time um, to see uh, AM or PM? AM. Uh, AM, yeah. Okay. Uh, but we're going to have some conversations leading up to that time and then in the hour or two leading up to that time to see Go for um, if there's any potential room for extension, but it wouldn't be a substantial extension. It would be like a, maybe a couple hours at most, yeah. I would imagine. Is that our first uh, spot lobster? Mm. Yeah, so it looks like, oh, yeah. yeah, this is a Chrysogorgia colony. Um, I would say okay, probably Chryseus or maybe Stellata. Um, I would say Probably the former, it seems more likely. We've collected that particular genus um, and morpha species uh, already on this expedition, as well as its associate. Another um, branch bamboo coral. This one looks like one we saw um, a bit further down slope right, uh, about half an hour ago. A lot of very small corals up here, nothing too big. There's some larger livrate branching primnoid colonies, um, but yeah, nothing too extraordinarily large here. So as we start to get up on top of the seamount, kind of in the vicinity of waypoint 9 or 10, um, the terrain is expected to change pretty dramatically from maybe these larger sloped um, areas where we have lots and lots of uh, loose uh, volcanic rubble and debris, um, maybe initially into sheet flows 
uh, and then finally into what is probably going to be sediment. Um, as we ran over the top of the seamount last night, we were looking at the sub bottom, and it appears that um, there is quite a bit of sediment up top, but yep. there is some terraces, or there are some terraces that we're trying to interrogate here, um, which may have other, you know, potential uh, volcanic features. What is that? What's going on there? Oh, tentacles. Tentacles around the mouth may have taken a meal recently, this anemone. Okay, go on. But uh, these terraces may represent either just the edges of volcanic flows or they may represent, you know, possible uh, history of. Um, uh, reef development, but it's really unclear uh, if they're carbonate or if they could be volcanic. So by hitting some of these terraces, the first one at uh, waypoint 10 and the second one at uh, waypoints 11 and 12. Science, I'm going to put something strange up on the Argus or the Atalanta monitor for just a second. Okay. Oh, it looks so good. Yeah. It looks so good. <laughs> That's all I wanted to see. Cyberly. Maybe ever. <laughs> <laughs> That's enough for Gabby. <laughs> all right. Uh, a viewer online wanted to know more about the breakdown of coral. So how does a breakdown between coral debris compared with a tree or plant there a chance and to a look at this? What, whatever yeah. this red thing is i don't know Ophiroid what that is. on a bamboo that's my uh, that's my cast in the dark no it's a <laughs> sea star um are we able to set up for a collection or are we moving yep, just oh, yeah. finished a move okay it looks like a sea star yeah it's a sea star Uh, I I think this might be a slurpable one. Okay. Um, okay. Given how long we it is. We don't have a ton of time for this yeah. one, unfortunately. See what you can but do. we'll make it work. Yeah, see what you can do. Slurp. So this is probably in the genus Polysterius. So are we going to slurp this the whole way or slurp and put in the box? Uh, or play it by ear, maybe. I don't know um, how it'll come off. Okay. I think it'll be pretty sticky. Um, so it might provide some resistance to suctioning, but I can't think of a better way to pick it up. If you think you can pick it up with the fingers, you can go for it, but... It doesn't usually work very well. Okay. So this, this genus was only described in 2015, and there are so few uh, species in this genus that um, it might be a new species. It's actually only two two species in this genus. We're all flushed and ready for jar one. Awesome, thanks. Ready yeah. for suction? Ready. There's 50%. All right. Maybe I'll just try and get the middle. Yeah, try for it. Like I said, it, this one is very sticky, so it's not like it's Gonna come up easily. Uh, oh, nice. Pushing you around. That's part of the deal. Part of the, it's part of the scrape and slurp. <laughs> I'll try to maybe get the limbs. Just want to chop them. These, this particular star has given us problems in the past. Uh, hence why oh, it's. Foxy. We can also try more suction too. Okay, I'll get on the center. Can you give me a little more suction.
can you scrape under the tentacles at all? It looks like the center is already up and it's holding on by its tentacles. Oh, yeah, I was just worried I was going to like damage them. <laughs> It, bit, it's so going yeah. to be damaged, and and that's okay. Um, okay. Yeah, do what I you can, I even if it's a partial. Yeah. Come here, little fella. Sea stars can regrow. Oh. Starting to come up. If if you can get the top half, that would be better. Okay. Uh, since oh it has well. more of the center. Nice. Beautiful. That's a hundred percent. Yes. Yeah. Great job. Do you want the other limbs? Uh, if you can. Yeah. yeah. Uh, if you gotta go, it's okay too. The the um, remainder will. We're we're stable. We're okay. fine. Okay. Sea stars do have the capacity to regenerate like they do in shallow waters. Um, so Can you zoom a bit, video? Brown, on what sample number is this? One, 200. 200. Right, that's sure. 100% there. Awesome, thanks. Very sticky. There we go. There you go. Yes. Oh, I know. Nice. Thank Goodness. you very uh -huh. much. So I'll tell you why that collection is important. Um, there's only two species in that genus, and we've seen it at Johnson Atoll before. And interestingly, those two species that are described from this uh, genus, one is only found in the Antarctic, and the other is only found at hydrothermal vents. Wow. So this is neither, neither of those two things, and so it's mm -hmm. almost certainly a new species. Can you put the potential ID in the chat? Yep. Okay, thanks. So this... Um, nice job. Thank you. This particular genus is called Polysterius, um, and the the type. Uh, so the original species for the genus was called uh, Polysterius tyleri, after um, Professor Paul Tyler at the NOC in the UK, National Oceanography Center uh, in the U uh, in the UK. It was a eminent deep sea biologist. Um, and he's done a lot of work. He pretty much wrote the book on deep sea biology. Uh, we have it down in the in the library in our uh, lounge uh, area. And so it was described by him, uh, described for him by Chris Ma in 2015. Chris is the curator of cor curator of uh, sea stars at the Smithsonian. Can we turn the down lights off, if possible? The down lights off? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's a cool. Um, somebody online wants to know more about eDNA and how the actual bottles work. So if we can explain, how does the water get flushed into the bottle at a time of sampling, and how is the water maintained once it reaches the surface without leaking out? Before we do that, is there any interest in any rocks before we put in another move? Yes, there it's is. It's pretty rocky <laughs> here. Yes, there is. <laughs> okay. Um, if you, I'll poke around a little bit. If you yeah. see anything loose, let me know. Yeah. What a lovely question. <laughs> Maybe that it's one there. Of, oh, okay. Yeah. That one. It's so botryoidal. 
It is. Actually, I think it is, but I'm just trying that out. <laughs> <laughs> How does it feel? Feels pretty good, right? Thanks. Patriotal. Well, this this cruise has told us up is down, left is right, uh, and that rounded rocks can be good rocks. Right. So never know. That's Could true. <laughs> Throw all the rules out the window with this I one. Think, I think the big takeaway was is the thin flat rocks are usually never good rocks. Yeah. Never judge a rock by its shape, unless it's flat. Unless it's flat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, have we had any good flat rock samples? I mean, we've had, fl if they were thick enough, then yeah, we've had a couple. But I mean, e even some of the thicker ones that were still flat were, remember the loaf of bread that looked like the shape of a loaf of bread? The it mushroom? It was manganese inside. Just I think so, yeah. That one was really cool. Yeah. All right. Yep. Not useful, but cool. Yeah. <laughs> we'll take it. <gasps> oh. No. Or not. Nope, that was a bad rock. <laughs> bad bad rock. rock. Okay, let's go find another rock. Yeah. I'm going to come up. Yeah, we're going to need to work on that flatness index, too. Uh, yeah. One of these has to be loose, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Can you pan down a little bit? Okay, so one that might have been... Maybe not. Okay. This rock has a beard here. I'm trying to figure out what's going on with this rock. Has a beard Which rock is that? In the still beard? cam. I think it's this one that you're looking at? Uh, no, I think, it's, I think it's off camera. Oh, okay. It's off the Zeus. Yeah. But it has some, some fuzzy, fuzzy stuff growing on it that's quite large. Bearded rock. Sorry. I know you're using that. Uh -huh. just wanted to know what he was talking about uh, back to dive. Yeah, so in, in the, in the upper left-hand corner of the still cam, it, am I making this up, or does anyone else see that? Yeah, I see it. I yeah. see it. Yeah. Uh, so I guess we just poke stuff? Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> is that rock on top poke of, of the large chunk in the bottom the left? The poke is of that science. Right? Which one? This one? Oh, that one. Uh. Is that the one you're looking at? It's only a little, but... Mm. Uh, I think it's a little too flat. Too flat? What about in that crack right to the left of that? crusty. Which one, uh, Robin, this oh, one? this one. Yeah. I think that's part of the cohesive rock mass. Maybe not? It's still cam, it looks like it. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Nice. Sure. Yeah. Ooh, can we spin a little slower? At so, this uh, yes. point, uh, getting desperate for rocks. Are we so, good? Yeah. We're keeping keep it. Yeah. So there, there's a a small arborescent foraminiferin on it too, that should help identify it. Can Just you kind of put that in the chat? This is yeah. 201 nav and and 201. Nick. 201 yep. rather. Cool. Alright. Happy? Yep. Starboard bow box. D farthest aft. D. Small one. So what is everybody looking forward to the most when you go back home? Oh. My dog. Mm, still cooking. Oh, was that you, Gabby? Yeah. What's your dog's name? Winston. Oh, oh Winston. God. What kind of dog is Winston? Um, that's a great question. <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a mutt. Okay, okay, okay. The yeah. best kind. Yeah. Best kind. He's a mutt with a lot of opinions. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we all? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I relate to Winston very strongly. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. And how old is Winston? Right, when in Delta. He turned seven while we were away. Aww. Oh. Yeah, he had his little birthday on the 16th. Oh. oh. 
so sweet. Is your sister watching Winston? No, uh, we had a friend watching it. Oh, okay. She sang him happy birthday and sent us a video. Uh, oh, that's amazing. But he had a cone head at the time. Oh. The whole oh. thing was really pathetic. <laughs> <laughs> Before we pick up here, can we zoom in on the rock fuzz? It's up in this direction. Yeah. Uh, Give with me the camera. one second. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that straight comb-like thing you're seeing at the top left of camera one is... Where did you want to look there, Steve? Yeah, so it's this rock here. Okay. It has fuzz on it. Uh, and, oh, yeah. Um, I don't know how on earth you saw that, but yes. <laughs> Super <laughs> triclops powers. Oh, the Steve's eye view. Yeah, yeah. The Steve's eye view. The Steve's eye view. I don't know what that could be, uh, but the best zoom you can get from here, I guess. What? What Stop. is that? Cool. It does have stubble. A what is going here, on? <laughs> Some pile of shadow on it. Is that full? Maybe onto a new geo geologic feature here. Is that full zoom? It's not. What do you got there? Those worms. Wow. Uh, I think they're hydroids or sponges, but I don't. I've never seen them before. I think they're probably hydroids. Is there? Is there a rock that's small enough that has that on them around there that we can see? Uh, yeah, pull back just a little bit, video. Uh, if there's there. no, if there's no pickable rocks, yeah, I don't see anything. Looks like ones on top of some little white yeah. ball yeah. in them or on them. The ones on the yeah. underside of the rock. Don't. Yeah, no, I don't. Odd. I don't see it. We yeah. could try a scrape and slurp if you think you have filters. No, no, I think I think they're just so fragile and small they'd be mangled. Yeah, okay. I'll skip it. Good to note. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think they are hydroids, but um, I've never seen them growing like that. We're before. in such a stable spot here. I'll just creep up and see if there's any rocks around here. Sure. I mean, they're growing off of multiple rocks, so it, 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 they all look really big, though. The biology knows the best rocks, the most stable rocks, and maintain that. Biology knows. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so the biology, like, almost uh, by definition, is going to pick the rocks that aren't going to be very sampleable. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. That's a beautiful shot in the cinema cam. Go for zoom. So, yes, again, those quote-unquote sticks that we're seeing are um, skeletons from... Uh, sponges. So again, they have a silica skeleton and it degrades very, 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 very slowly. What's so that little critter? Oh, it's a polynoid. Uh, it's a scale worm. It's a polycute worm. Okay. Scale worm. Yep. Yeah, I think we can move on. Okay, uh, go away. We're not going to sample anything. It doesn't look very easy. Yeah, the sponge skeletons, and when I first started this, it got me too. They really, really look like actual bones uh, from a, a uh, vertebrae. Do you think we should move on? Yes. Okay. Uh, I cool. think we can have a ship move. Right or bridge now. Can I see the for a second? Yep. Uh, three zero meters, two eight zero. feature here. Oh, hey, Davey. Good to see you on the chat. Um, so Davey has a question about arborescent. What does that mean? I didn't even hear anybody say arborescent. So yeah, what does it mean? I was making a note um, uh -huh. on the rock we had collected. There was a small foraminiferin, um, similar so the same group as the xenophyophores, but um, these foraminiferins form like branchy tree-like uh, structures on the rock, and uh, so w w we we term them arborescent, so tree-like, you know, in reference oh. to trees ar arbor. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, I see on. it now. Cool. Emma? 
what was the, uh, the first word that you said today that made us all go, ooh, I forgot it already. When, the one that means like. Oh, the popperate? The popperate. I wanted to say potpourri. <laughs> <laughs> That's not it. <laughs> The popper is uh, lacking in species. Yes. So the opposite of diversity, pretty much. Yeah. Oh, what is that? Oh, yeah. It's Go for zoom. Oh, it's running away. No. no. It looks like one of the crabs no. with anemones. What's that? Oh, a crab with an anemone yeah. on it. No, the five, yeah. five prong one. The, the um, hermit crabs with the zoanthid backpacks, yeah. The zoanthid backpacks. School's starting soon. Honestly, some of my <laughs> favorite. Maybe the Steve's eye view can see it. I can't see it. No, it's 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 in there. It's a pretty good it's overhang. I can't quite see it's it. All I wanted. It's in class. I'm try to zoom on the cyclops. But that it knows exactly where to go in this environment to avoid us is stunning. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing, hey. Eh? It makes you wonder how many of them are out here and just yeah. have yeah. 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 running away. That's so true. Okay. Just can't see. Stay in school. <laughs> Stay in school. <laughs> Don't go running around with a zoanthid backpack. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cute. That'll teach him. <laughs> Stay in school. <laughs> <laughs> um, how many samples can we collect during an expedition? Excellent question. I know that there are a certain amount of biological samples that we can collect as well as geological, and I forget what those numbers are, so if you all can remind me. 20 biology samples per site, and uh, 20 geology samples per site, and okay. five push cores per site, oh, and six water oh, yeah. samples per site. Okay, can you stop the ship for me? Bridge nav. But, uh, Okay. As long as we stay uh, within those bounds, we can collect as many way. total so samples as we um, well, turning, can, can you keep an eye over, on the 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 over the course today. of the expedition. Got it. This is science. We're just getting a wrap out of the tether. Copy. All right, does the ROV rest on the ocean floor or is it always hovering? I think, I think sometimes it rests. Is that correct, pilots? Yeah, we sometimes sit down on the seabed just to um, become steady if we need to do something quite intricate or um, you know, something where the, the little bit of heave from the ocean would, um, would make it more difficult. Thanks, Karen. Okay. <laughs> that looks, looks better. Can we do the down lights off if possible? Yeah. Thank you. Uh -huh. And then we're getting another question. Are there any creature sounds this deep? Excellent. Um, most likely, I would say, we don't have a hydrophone available um, on oh these God. dives of this expedition. Uh, but yeah, sound, tra sound travels really, really far in the ocean, so I wouldn't be surprised if there were some sounds going on. But I, w I imagine that the probably the loudest sound right now might be Hercules. For <laughs> just so we can um, see the tether. Maybe the front, well. motor of Hercules yeah. might be causing a tiny bit of a ruckus down there, but I wouldn't be surprised if there were other sounds too. It's just like, oh no. Okay, it's all good. It's so dark. Yeah. So negative a half. Can you just write down in the red book as soon as things chill out, like, or right now, whatever, uh, that negative a half, put a lazy loop in? Good eye.
That looks better. Yeah. Cool. Would these okay. be considered pillow basalts? Nick, continue. Yep. Great. Yeah, I just uh, actually wrote that down in my notes. I'm going into a little bit more pillow basalt morphology. Three zero meters to eight zero. And then it kind of looks like it becomes more of a sheet yeah, it's on kind the of right of the cinema cam. It's kind of hovering uh, in between a sheet and pillow, and you know, you can you can kind of see where the hexagonal formation comes from when you're looking at columnar basalts just by looking at this little area right here. Not that it's that's what this is, but you can kind of see similar pattern. Is there any chance to zoom on? this part of the colony yeah there are some white dots on the branches and i want to see if those are grazers go for zoom kind of just above where the damage is this area push in more Okay, they're not grazers, they're barnacles, it looks like. Uh, if you have any more zoom, just maybe. That's all I got, unfortunately. Okay, go wide, I can push in further. I got a it's, little time. Yeah, if, if you have time, it's, yeah, yeah. it's not totally. extremely urgent. They, they look like associated animals, but there's definitely some damage to this um, primnoid colony here. All of the associated organisms are on the coral, which... Uh, it doesn't seem like they're the ones doing the grazing. Um, at least that's not something that's known. But uh, there may be other other damage, other tissue loss from other grazers or uh, parasites. Yeah. Okay. They're they're not barnacles. They're anemones. Uh, those anemones could be could be fighting the octocoral polyps uh, for space, and that could be just killing off some of the branches. Okay, thanks for that. Okay. So if those anemones are fighting with the coral polyps, would they necessarily be considered associates at that point, or are they more like a parasite? Well, yeah, we use the term associate because it's it's um, if it's an uncertain relationship, um, you know, it's it's an association. It doesn't signify that it's a beneficial or or negative uh, relationship by calling it associate. And it's more because we just have such a snapshot in time of these activities on the seafloor, um, you know, between corals and other animals, and so. As we start to accumulate more data, maybe we can formulate some hypotheses around this, but we still don't have conclusive evidence of what they're doing. We know that from, um, for example, galls that are formed by some of these corals that they do um, smother some of these uh, anemones, you know, uh, in, in, in case them in calcium carbonate galls, uh, much like trees might, uh, you know, uh, cut off a parasite by you know, uh, smothering it in, you know, in wood, um, or what we know it with its growth. Uh, so this is much, much the same. Um, so it's a, it's an implied relationship that it's a, a negative one. But until we know, we just use the term association. Got it. Bamboo coral seems like the same species we've been seeing. Okay, somewhat on. sparsely branched. Um, I believe we collected this earlier in the expedition too, so it should make it easy to identify. This kind of low branching, it's consistently low branching. All right, someone online wants to know: Would the Dead Sea sponges be considered fossils? Uh, at this point. Not technically, right? Um, don't so for fossils to be fossils, it Bridge needs up. to be completely replaced by rock material, right? 
Yeah, you can essentially. Add another three zero uh, meters so to eight zero. A fossil is pretty much defined as any type of you know, organism or even a trace of an organism, like a burrow, um, can be considered a trace fossil. Um, our corporalites, if you remember our discussion the other day, are trace <laughs> fossils. And what are uh, corporalites again? Uh, Nick? We'll, we'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> Fine. Uh, just basically any type of evidence of, of you know, um, a creature, living creature, uh, that was buried into some kind of sediment or low oxygen environment and uh, lithified into a rock over time, making a, a cast of that of that feature. Mm. I wouldn't consider these fossils quite yet, even though, like Steve mentioned earlier, they might have been there for quite some time. Yep. Is that a baby chana cups? Oh, oh yeah, it is. Uh, yeah. Something cinema funny. cat, baby chana cups. Uh, maybe. 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 It's a something. It's swimming. It's oh, maybe something. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it actually might be. I've never it. seen more of these on this expedition than any other I've Good. ever been on. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so thrilled right now. <laughs> This is not nearly as oh, new as the one that staff saw yesterday, but it's a baby chana cup. Sitting down, look at those legs. It looks look so, so legs. Gang gangly, you know, like it can't control itself. <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> learning, <laughs> give it a chance. <laughs> just crashes into the sea floor. <laughs> we'll just, just watch the chana cups of that Bounce. size is probably older than um, oh, yeah, all of us combined. Oh, little tumble. Good job. Oh, it's doing so good. Nice landing, buddy. Oh, lovely. It's doing so good. <laughs> nice crevice well, to find yeah, the baby. Yeah. Yes. Trying to hide. So, yeah, okay. Can't blame. Just That's planned a good the whole time. Spot. Okay. Nice job. Okay. Goodbye, little one. <laughs> good hiding spot. Well, there it goes. Oh, yep. like, I'm out of here. Oh, so cute, little feet. <laughs> so, <laughs> darling. <laughs> Charismatic megafauna. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, megafauna. More of minor fauna. I like three inches long. <laughs> still, still mega. Mm -hmm. Tiny mega fauna. Mega in our hearts. In Steve's world. The well, the the um, the lower threshold for megafauna is actually quite small. Oh really? Yeah. Um, like in the t like in the in like range? the taxonomic sense or the. The evolutionary biology sense? What do you mean? In the ecological sense. Okay. Yeah. What makes it mega? I'll give you a definition in a second. He's going into the mind palace. <laughs> <laughs> going into the mind forest? <laughs> the mind palace. Oh, the palace. It's I so like forest better. <laughs> shrimp. Shrimp. What's our shrimp count, Brown? I feel like it's got to be pretty good. Um, I, I didn't do it this morning. Oh. <laughs> Ron would said, nope. That's okay. That's enough of those shrimp. But on the board right now, it says 10. I don't know if that was from 12 to 4. Probably. Look at all these corals, Steve. Yeah, it's a nice sight. Bridge now. So a lot of. Um, Can I add another three zero meters to two eight zero? A lot of applications to the word megafauna are often uh, usually for terrestrial organisms of a certain weight, but uh, mm -hmm. megafauna, at least in the deep sea uh, and in the marine environment, is usually anything greater than you know. Uh, several tens of centimeters or even 10 centimeters or more. Macrofauna really focuses on, you know, the, the half, a mil half a centimeter up to maybe 10 centimeter size range, but it's not extremely well defined. So there's two coral right in front of us. One of them is covered with associates mm -hmm. and one of them has none. What's is that the a difference? math question? 
Yeah, I know it's not that. How many watermelons? Yeah. <laughs> watermelons. Train departs east. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, this one's covered with yeah. brittle stars. Yeah. And then this one, I don't, I can't tell whether they're the same or different corals, but this one has nothing. Yeah. Uh, they're probably the same. Um, I, I can't, honestly can't tell you why. Uh, I would assume that the brittle stars know the better flow condition and maybe, you know, just that small difference, you know, being lower in, in the, in between the rocks down lower is better for them. Mm. Um, but yeah, I don't know. They, they're, 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 I guess, more attuned to that particular colony because, because of its location. Oh, interesting. This paper suggests that microbial mats could be megafauna. Really? Wow. Interesting. Yeah, th th it's just so weird. Like, the definitions are, are very flexible. So this paper cites megafauna as microbial mats, giant unicellular eukaryotes, and large demersal fishes. Huh. What's a, what would be a giant unicellular eukaryote? Is that like... A are there like giant amoebas or something? Uh, yeah, I think maybe like uh, Xenophyophorus. Oh, okay. Would be an example of that. All right. Nice. So we've got a couple different, yeah, mostly, I think these are, um, oh, what is this? What's what? Give it a second oh. to look at that. The branching pattern is just striking because there's more branches coming off of each branch point than in other colonies we've seen Go so far. Zoom. Possibly a new observation of a particular bamboo coral here. Interesting. Okay. Uh, do you have a time for a snip and slurp? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. You can hold the ship. I'd love to take some of the lay back out anyways. Roger. Bridge, no? Hold position. Slurp, slurp jar two. Okay. Yeah, in this case, I think we'd swing, we'll swing too far for the hold to help us here, but it'll get some of the lay back out. Be better for later. Yeah, so that uh, fish that we saw a few moments ago, that was a um, juvenile chanacops, C-H-A-U-N-A-C-O-P-S. There's also known as a, uh, um, as a toadfish, or excuse me, a sea toad. Okay, sounds good. Nav off comes. So we knew it was a juvenile because of its gray color. Okay. When they're adults, then they're more of like a kind of orangish red color. Right, and they're just, I think they're really cute. So I get super excited whenever we see them. We're looking for basically at least 10 centimeters of a branch, any branch or multiple branches, whatever you can grab. Okay. Data, we're going for uh, two. sample jar two. Video, you can zoom in a bit. Thank you. That's nice. You have bubble on it as well. Oh, awesome! Thanks. Here, I'll give you, give you it closer. Somebody online is asking about kelp. 
um, that's found off the west coast, would that be considered, uh, like, I'm assuming the west coast of the CONUS? I don't know what the CONUS stands for. C O N U S. Steve? Uh, yes, that's probably fine. Yeah. Probably fine. I think it should be able to go into the slurp. Oh, you think it's too long then? Uh, if it, if you think it's too long, yeah, maybe cut it a little bit more to the top. Okay. Yeah. Good. Yeah, that that, that looks good though. That continental United States. That's a very nice piece. Yeah. And if we'd rather. If, if it doesn't go easily, I don't think it'll go easily. Maybe we'll go to the forward box. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Sorry to change that up again. Okay. You want it to go in the forward box? Yeah. Okay. Hold on one second. Maybe. What do you think? Omega? Omega, yeah. Yeah. Omega. Um, we have something that looks just like it in uh, Lambda. Uh, we just don't want to put them together. Okay. So we'll put it in Omega? Yeah. The, there are two different families of um, coral. So this is a bamboo, and the other one was a primnoid. They're pretty easy to tell apart on deck, but okay. we'll keep them separate for now, just to give, hedge our bets a little bit in case we want to collect something else later. They only look the same to our ROV pilots, maybe. <laughs> well, the thing is, the bamboo are very slimy, and they tend to slime on other things. Only if they get warm. If they, if they hold temperature, they're usually OK. Yeah, the forward box is questionable on what temperature it will be when it comes yeah. up. It's been pretty good the past few dives. There was a seal that was replaced and it's held temperature really nicely. And one of the things that makes bamboo corals really interesting taxonomically is that some mucus and some don't mucus at all. Um, and you really don't know until you start to look at the different characters. This is a beautiful branch. Like It's got really nice um, branches coming off of it. Really nice uh, at the node branching. Almost you know, kind of trichotomous branching uh, towards the base end. Nice. And um, can we pop a NISC in here also before we leave? Yeah, so CONUS, continental United States, the kelp that's found on the western coast of that, would it be considered megafauna? Technically, I don't know, because kelp isn't, it's a protist. Okay, whenever you're ready. Right, mm -hmm. so it's not a plant or an animal. Sorry, so is there a preference on the number? Five. Five. I don't Three, necessarily know if it you. would be considered megafauna, but it is giant for sure. And then, do we know how long Chana cops can that live? Excellent question. I nice don't grab. know. If I find out, Thanks I'll let you know. Mm -hmm. All right. Great question. So, in the vicinity of this eDNA sample, we have. Uh, at least two different, maybe three different primnoidae, uh, and then two different species of bamboo coral. This kind of one we just collected that has the multi-branched um, nodes, and then the sparsely branching uh, node brancher as well, with the longer, longer branches. Ooh, I just saw an Aridogorgia. I haven't oh seen yeah? one yet this much. Just nice. in the butt cam. Yep. Yeah, they, uh, the last crew saw one, just one um, right before we came on. So we know these things are in the area, and this is actually a really useful um, tool that kind of illustrates why eDNA can be useful and important for characterizing the seafloor in these areas, because you know we have a swath of what, like maybe five meters of light across in our camera, and then maybe uh, you, you know 2,800 oh, meters is our track length here. here. Um, so we're really looking at a very small area of the seafloor 
and if we miss something just because it's in the just outside of our view by a couple of meters um, it would not make our species lists as we annotate these dives but we can use eDNA and if we trigger um, a sequence associated with an, e, uh, an eDNA sample for a coral or another organism um, it tells us a lot more about the biodiversity potential of a site. Oh, there's a hemichorallium as well. Nav, there was two targets there, 202 and 203. Thanks. Um, Roger. Looks like we're missing 199. You're missing 199. That was a rock. Uh, was that on our watch? Yep. Yes. Roger. I can tell you the time if that's helpful. That might be. Sorry, did you say yes? Sure. 1440? 1440, rather. Thanks. All right, so a few moments ago we took a... Uh, uh, rock, maybe? Yeah, a rock, maybe? Uh, yeah, that was a rock at 1440. Oh, no, um, nine nine. I'm oh. asking if <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Nick wants a rock now. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like you knew the answer to that I question. did know the answer. <laughs> I, what happened was I wanted a rock now. <laughs> All right. <laughs> it's contagious. Uh, so is it a buoyancy thing? Bronwyn, what see. was sample 203? 203 was a NISC. I don't know. Maybe Scandals. some of these could be loose. Yeah, I'm yeah. sure maybe something possibly to the left over here. Bamboo coral. Yeah, that's exactly what I was looking at. Oh, 202 was the NISC? No, 202 was the bamboo coral. Oh, 203 okay, was the NISC. So while Nick uh, selects a rock, again, the uh, eDNA sample that we just took a moment ago with the Niskin bottle, uh, that helps to give a profile of what kinds of organisms might be living in the surrounding area. So as it collects that water sample, uh, little particles and uh, that, one. that one, yeah. Okay. Uh, cells that contain DNA are able to be processed and then uh, studied to see what kinds of animals that might be living down in this area. Nice. It's a good one. Crip Force 9. Oh, yeah. Good Force 9. <laughs> I like that one. Good Force 9. Good rock. Good, yeah. What's that on the bottom? Can we can we maybe zoom on that? Is that an identifiable feature? Because all the boxes have rocks in them. Uh, okay. I don't know. If we could turn. Yep. Okay. I, I want to cut that one open. <laughs> That's yours? I call dibs. Right. Can we do 195? Or, sorry, uh, starboard bow box B, the second mm. one forward. B, got it. What was that sample number? 204. Thank you. Right. Yes, so with eDNA samples, um, environmental DNA, if I'm not mistaken, it um, surveys what kinds of species might be around as well as the abundance of those said species. Um, yes, it depends on how much detail you want to use. Um, so abundance is a very tricky thing you have to know how much eDNA animals shed. Otherwise, uh, you're kind of just really guessing. So it's been used to oh, nice. estimate abundance in fisheries because those have been really well studied. We know how much uh, environmental DNA, you know, fishes might slough off and, um, you know, over the course of uh, a day or 
however much amount of time of their life. Um, so you can do those kind of quantitative metrics, but <laughs> it's very difficult to do that out here. Uh, we're really just looking kind of a first pass exploration of what environmental DNA can tell us about what kind of diversity of species are in this area. And really we're focusing mostly on corals and octocorals here, which compose the bulk of the substrate, um, compose the bulk of the animals that attach to the hard substrate here in terms of diversity and abundance. Nice. And then a follow-up question. We're getting somebody who's interested in getting samples of their own to uh, test out if they can uh, do some e and day, excuse me, e-DNA um, sampling and processing. Is that something that can be done like in a high school or a college setting? Um, I don't know. Uh, not using the method that we're using. Um, it requires some pretty advanced um, sequencing technology. Uh, but yeah, I, I would imagine that there are probably programs that are developing these types of experiments for learning, but um, I'm not aware of any. I did that very, I mean, not, not nearly as comprehensive, but um, and I think it was only really possible in the small or college lab setting because they had very specific markers they were looking for. They weren't trying to type everything that was in the eDNA sample, but did that a little bit in Seattle where they were trying to kind of figure out exactly what type of crabs what kind were of around. What kind of instrument do you use to nice. process the data in eDNA samples? Um, so we, sequ we sequenced our eDNA samples um, on an Illumina MySeq okay. Science, platform. sorry to interrupt. Is there anything yep. else we want to do here? No, thank you. Negative. Great. Okay. Bridge now. And uh, those those sequence, uh, sequence data are you know then downloaded and they the go through some zero. processing and cleaning of the data. Um, so it, it it's really jumbled until we process it and make sense of it. Uh, you know sequences and strings of letter and code. Um, do you but also do uh, any yeah. like ICPMS mass spectrometry uh, on those uh, same samples to, to look at the chemistry of, of, the, uh, of the water? No, we don't do any of that. Yeah, yeah we pretty much, um, we're, we're taking the water, filtering out everything from it, so we're left with mm. a very concentrated amount of environmental DNA and a filter and uh, extract that. It, well, we put it in a lysis buffer, so it, as soon as we put it in the lysis buffer, it bursts open the cells uh, that are present and it allows the eDNA to be more um, easily preserved, uh, putting the DNA in contact with the preservation buffer. And then we have to go through an extraction process, which is somewhat, in, somewhat invol involved. Um, and we need to amplify it and then sequence it. So th there's many steps. There's many, many steps. Yeah. It's very easy to say you're doing eDNA, but it's it's a very expensive to do it, and it's it's a very sensitive type of experiment to avoid contamination and these types of things. So sounds like isotope analysis. Mm -hmm. It's similar. Yeah, yeah, similar. Yeah, definitely the stuff I did. We were just we did the lysis buffer and all that and kind of concentrated and did PCR, but then we were just kind of looking at um, bioluminescent like agar plates, which is yeah. oh, not a, not a very, <laughs> I mean, it's it, it does the job, but it's pretty um, rough. All right, thanks for that. Okay. Zoom, we're ready. Go in. Yeah, I think, um, you know, genetic methods are becoming more and more commonly taught everywhere, and I think that's important if you're interested in the biological sciences um, we're moving to you know a time where sequencing capacity and power is so much greater and the costs are so much lower than they've ever been 